And so your job is to not be silent. So here are 10 rules for fighting the left. These are practical rules for debating folks on the left. I try to be practical because I know that you know, you'll hear a lot of speeches about ideology and philosophy of conservatism, uh, but there are fewer people who talk about the tactics and strategy you should use in dealing with folks on the left, and fewer still who will tell you actual practical strategies as opposed to how to, how to discuss the, the politics of the issue. So here are practical strategies that you can use. The first strategy is more mentality. When you're in debate with somebody on the left, well, before I even get there, why should you debate somebody on the left? And when should you debate somebody on the left? The truth is, you shouldn't always debate people on the left. You know, when you're on college campuses, there are really only a few reasons to debate anyone on the left in the first place. The, the first is that you are forced to under the rules of the classroom for some odd reason. Uh, the, the second is because they're serving you food, which is a high likelihood, and they're going to spit it in unless you talk politics with them. Uh, and, the, and the only other reason is if this is, well, if the person happens to be an honest leftist, you found the one honest leftist in America, congratulations, it's unlikely. So the only other reason that you should ever have a conversation or be friends with anyone on the left is, and, and not even be friends, is if you are in public in front of a large audience, and then your goal is to humiliate them as badly as possible. <laughs> that is the goal of the conversation. The goal is not to convince the person. The goal is not to make friends with that person. You know, if, if, the, if you want to make friends with the person, there's a whole different conversation you can have. But the conversations that are going to make the most difference on campus are the ones where you're in public in front of large groups of people or with a camera nearby, and your goal then is to make these people look as bad as possible, to unmask them before the world. That is the goal, which sounds harsh until you realize that that's what they're doing to you each and every day. That's what they're doing on CNN. That's what they're doing on MSNBC. That's what they're doing to all the Republican candidates. It's what they did in all first, the first three debates were all about trying to make Republicans look bad, trying to make conservatives look bad. That's the goal, to make you look like a bad person. You have to go in with the mentality that you're going to hit them first and you're going to hit them hard and they're not going to get up. And so that's the first, the first lesson, okay? You don't wait to be hit. You don't wait to get aggressive. You assume from the outset that you're going to be aggressive. And then if you're a little over aggressive, then you back off. But you go in aggressive. Better to be too aggressive at the outset than the opposite. And that takes us to the second rule, which is you must frame your opponent. Okay, this is something that people on the right don't like to do, because by, by nature we're sort of nice, gentle, easygoing folk with families and lives, and this is not our, our first priority. This is why the left wins. So why did Mitt Romney lose in 2012? All right, this is a good example of framing your opponent. Why did Mitt Romney lose in 2012? Mitt Romney lost in 2012. He had bad computer programs. Orca died on him. Uh, he had various bad get-out-the-vote strategies. He made some boo-boos. The real reason that Mitt Romney lost in 2012 is because Mitt Romney basically characterized Barack Obama as a nice guy who was incompetent. And Barack Obama characterized Mitt Romney as an evil Darth Vader piece of human debris. Barack Obama basically said that Mitt Romney was the guy who would put dogs on the top of cars. Mitt Romney was the guy who was going to, in the words of Vice President Joe Biden, put y'all back in chains. Mitt Romney was the fellow who was going to specifically fire you so that a few years later you would lack health insurance and your wife would die of cancer. Right? That's who Mitt Romney was. Mitt Romney was a bad guy. Mitt Romney, he, and for those of us who are, who are, are not leftists, this seems bizarre because Mitt Romney is actually one of the more vanilla people on planet Earth. But... The, the implication, if you talk to folks on the left, the idea is that Mitt Romney was a bad man. He was a bad, mean man. And from the right, the perspective on Obama is that Obama, he, he wasn't really a bad, mean man. But Obama was just a guy who's not very good at his job. So if you're just a voter and you don't know much about anything, and remember, always remember your audience. You're not talking to the leftist. You're talking to the people watching you talk to the leftist, right? So those people, in, when they went into the ballot box to vote, they had to decide, do I vote for the guy who is mean but competent, or the guy who's really, really nice and has the best intentions at heart, but just isn't that great at his job. And people in the United States tend to vote for nice but incompetent over mean but competent any day of the week. So the goal of the left is to characterize you as mean and nasty and corrupt and evil. And you know this. If you talk to people on the left, the first thing on any topic that they will say is that you are a racist, a sexist, a bigot, or a homophobe. That's not an argument. That is a character attack. It's a character assault. They're saying, you are a bad human being, and thus, I can say whatever I want to you now. That's why the, the calls of white privilege are a character attack on you. Right? They don't even have to prove you're a racist. Just by the nature of you being white or being non-black, or even if you are black and conservative, you're a beneficiary of white privilege, like Ben Carson. It's okay to call him a beneficiary of white privilege, even though he is not. You know, they, all of this is okay because your character is flawed. Because your character is flawed, they can attack you. So your goal is to attack their character. And this is something people on the right get really shy about. Right? We don't like to do it because it's not nice. Well, tough. Do it. 
Because the truth is that when you say things like you're a racist without evidence, you are a bad person. And the, the way that I, I learned this lesson pretty well, or at least taught it relatively well, is I don't know how many of you saw the debate that I did with Piers Morgan about three years ago on gun control. It went a little bit viral. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, and Piers Morgan had been pushing this notion that anybody who disagreed with him about gun control didn't care enough about the dead kids in Sandy Hook. I did this debate with him on national TV about a month after the Sandy Hook elementary massacre. And so we start off the debate, and literally the first thing that, that happens is he, sa he says to me, you've said I'm off the rails, why do you say I'm off the rails? And I said, Piers, I say you're off the rails because you stand on the graves of the kids of Sandy Hook to promote your political agenda. And he collapsed. I mean, there was nothing he could do. He clutched at his pearls and he said, how dare you? And, <laughs> and, and I said, well, I've watched your show, I know that that's true. And he, again, he said, how dare you? I said, well, that's not an argument, right? I've seen your show, it's true. The reason that he couldn't come back is because he was so used to attacking the character of the person sitting across from him that he wasn't used to the idea that now he was going to have to defend his own character for making allegations that were utterly false. So if someone makes a false allegation about you, if they dump racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe on you, the first thing you should say is you're a jerk. Right? You're a jerk. And we, what makes you a jerk is not that I just think that you're wrong on your politics. What makes you a jerk is that you're leveraging unevidenced allegations against people specifically to promote your political agenda. That makes you a jerk. And that's okay. You can do that. And in fact, you can even, you can even open that way, right? It's, it's, it's okay. You don't even have to respond that way. As long as you know that they're going to do that, you can call out the tactic before it's used. So that's point number two. Third point, you need to frame the debate. What I mean by this is that the left is great at framing the terminology of the debates and how these debates are going to be held. And the right is terrible at it. So for example, the Million Student March, right? They're out there marching right now and they say, we want free education. Education is a right, not just for the rich and white, right? This is their, their little chant, which of course comes as a shock to, to no one that, that it, it, it turns into a race thing because everything turns into a race thing. So well, the, the idea is to frame the debate as education is a right. Now, you, now you're on the other end. You have to explain why education is not a right, right? You should reject that, that framing of the debate. The debate is not whether education is a right, because obviously it's not. I mean, education is not a right any more than housing is a right. Nothing is a right that you have to steal from someone else, right? Bottom line is the only rights that you have are rights that exist in the absence of you stealing stuff from other people. Right? I don't have a right to your services. I don't have a right to your money. I don't have a right to your car. I don't have a right to your wife. I don't have a right to any of these things, right? What I have a right to is you leaving me alone, right? But you don't, have to, you don't even have to go there, right? Once they say education is a right, People automatically, their, their minds, it's just the way the brain works, people go, rights are good. So rights are good, and they say education is a right. That means education is good. And you want to deprive these poor kids of education? Instead of arguing education is a right, you should ask a very basic question. Why is it okay for you to steal other people's money? What makes you morally superior that you get to steal other people's money? When you say you want a free education, what you're really saying is that you are owed my money, that you get to steal my money for your own lesbian dance theory major. And guess what? You don't. Your useless major in, in ancient Greek economics is of no concern to me. And not only that, you are a morally deficient human being. Remember, all of leftism is based on unearned moral superiority, them feeling like better people than you. You take that away from them, they've got nothing. So if you say to them, you know, you, it is morally deficient to steal from people. It is morally deficient. I mean, th this was actually my objection. How many of you saw, did any of you see the Neil Cavuto debate uh, yesterday? Uh, oh, there's, there's a girl from the Million Student March who's on Neil Cavuto, and she clearly had no idea how the economy works or the English language <laughs> or, fundamental, or fundamental punctuation, anything. Um, and, and so she's there, and Neil Cavuto is asking her, where do you think all this money's coming from? And I thought, okay, well, this is sort of useful because it's clear she doesn't know what she's talking about, but it wasn't useful in the sense that nobody who was on, who was on the fence came out of that on, on Cavuto's side because the premise was still her premise. Her premise was, it's okay to take money from the 1%. When people say, you know, the 1% will pay for it, the answer shouldn't be, well, the 1% won't be able to afford it, because that's assuming their morality. It's okay to take money from the 1%. The answer should be, what makes you think it is okay to steal money from people, period? Do you just get to rob people's houses? Is this your thing? Right? You're allowed to ask that question. Okay, fourth point. You need to spot inconsistencies in the left's argument. The left rarely, if ever... They're getting actually more consistent now because they're coming out as the communists that they are. But usually, the left <laughs> argues from a position of not full communism. It's actually harder in some ways to argue with Bernie Sanders than it is to argue with Hillary Clinton. It's pretty easy to argue with Hillary Clinton because she's wildly inconsistent. 
Okay? Every leftist position holds an internal inconsistency, all of them. Because if they took it to the logical extreme, the left will never take its own positions to the logical extreme because their positions are so offensive and terrible to the vast majority of Americans. The, the obvious example that comes to mind for me on this one is when you hear people like President Obama say he wants common sense gun regulations, right? Or Hillary Clinton, common sense gun regulations. That's all we want, common sense gun regulations. And then you say, okay, well, what do those look like? And they have no answer. And usually they say something like the assault weapons ban, right? We want, we want to ban assault weapons. So you say, okay, well, you want to ban assault weapons because theoretically this is going to minimize murder, correct? Well, then why is it that there are twice as many assault weapons in the country, right, rifles and long guns in the country as there are handguns, and yet there are about six to seven times as many murders committed with handguns as long guns, but you don't want to, you don't want to get rid of the handguns. And you can see their eyes glaze over because the inconsistency is so glaring. Because the truth is what you want them to do, the, your goal here is to force them into a consistency. Right? You want to force them to admit that what they really want to do is take all the guns, which is what they want to do. That's what the left wants to do. The left wants all the guns. The left wants Australia, Great Britain. They want all the guns. And the minute they admit that, they lose the argument because this is a country with 300 million guns and 200 million Americans with guns. So, there, so the idea that there's going to be you know, a, a huge swath of Americans who buy into this is just not true. So spot the inconsistencies, and we can do it in any of their arguments. Right, you can do it. I, I, what Carly Fiorina did during the debates about Planned Parenthood was great because it, it shows the inconsistency of the left. They say they're pro-choice, and they say that they, that it's a moderate position to be pro-choice. And then, I mean, I honestly, I wish that she had actually just brought a picture of a baby at 27 weeks and said, "Hillary Clinton wants to kill this. Wants you to be able to kill this. Please explain why." Right, it's the inconsistency. You're pro-life. You're pro-children, but you're okay with killing this. Right, you can if you show them the inconsistencies in their positions. People resonate to arguments about hypocrisy, and the left are hypocrites unless they go full scale. And if they go full scale, they're extremists. Fifth point, you need to force them to answer questions. So when I say be aggressive, what that really means is asking them the questions. The left loves to ask questions, and it's usually questions like, why do you hate gay people? Right? It's always questions like, so you hate black people, right? Or how much do you, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being Ku Klux Klan and 1 being John Birch Society, how much do you hate black people? Right? And, and your job is to force them to answer questions about their own philosophy. Because the truth is, especially on campus, most people who consider themselves left actually aren't. They don't know what they're talking about. They've just bought into whatever they're hearing around them so they can go to all the cool kid parties and they can be part of the tolerant and diverse majority. Right? They can be, they can, they can be part of that free exchange of idea. And, the, and, and so it is, it is vitally important to get them to answer questions because at a certain point, either they will start to examine their own premises or the people who are watching will start to examine the inconsistencies that they're seeing uh, among, among the, these various positions. A sixth point, don't get distracted. So this, is, this, this still happens some, but, but a little bit less now since we're so, so many years away from Bush. The, the usual distraction tactic of the left was if you had said anything about Obama ever, the answer was, but Bush, they just start yelling it. It didn't, even, it didn't matter what you were talking about. It didn't matter the topic. It would just start, they start yelling, and, and, and like Linda Blair and the Exorcist, green vomit would start flying out of their mouth, and they would just shout Bush over and over until they collapsed in a stupor. And, and then their fellows would, would clap and tell them they'd won the argument. So, it, and and the, the right has an unfortunate tendency to follow people down rabbit holes. So Ted Cruz, who I love. Yeah, I think Ted Cruz is a great candidate. I think that you know, he has flaws as a candidate, but he's a very solid conservative. He did this the other night in the debate, and, it, and it, it's, it is kind of his fault, since I know people who had told him not to do it. But he was asked very specific questions about his tax plan by Neil Cavuto, and he forgot that there was an audience, and he just started getting very specific about his tax plan. And even I, who am very into this stuff, my eyes glazed over and I was lost. When you're arguing with people on the left, it's even worse. What they will do is they'll throw out red herrings. Usually, the, the most common red herring you hear is gay marriage, always, because this is a topic on which the left feels comfortable. It doesn't matter what you're talking about, they will throw out either gay marriage or abortion or birth control, right? These are their favorites. So Hillary Clinton, anytime you say, we want smaller government, Hillary will say, well, except for abortion, let's talk about abortion, right? Which has nothing to do with anything, because I'm also in favor of big government for prosecution of murder. When it comes to criminal law, there's nothing wrong with a, a government enforcement of criminal law. That's the whole question on the table. But the, the, the idea here by the left is always when they're in trouble, they distract. When they're in trouble, they throw something against the wall. It's okay for you to say, we'll get back to that issue later. If you want to discuss George W. Bush's record in Iraq and not Obama's with regard to ISIS, we can do that later. I'm happy to talk about that later. But why don't we actually talk about the guy who's in office? Let's talk about what's happening now. 
Like we can also have a conversation about Woodrow Wilson's policies towards the Russian Revolution, but we'll save that for later. Right, well, let's talk about the topic that we're talking about right now. You have to pin them down. Because trying to argue with leftists, they stick and move. It's, it's, like, it's like trying to nail jello to the wall. They're, they're constantly just <laughs> moving around. They're very slippery. Okay. The, the seventh point is if you don't know something, you're allowed to admit it. You're allowed to admit it. So usually leftists don't have a lot of facts in their tiny brains, but they usually have one. And it's usually one that you don't know because it's completely irrelevant to anything. Right? It's some topic that they studied as their, as their thesis in philosophy, their third year philosophy thesis, and it's, and it's got, it's, it's some minute point of leftist philosophy that you've never heard of, or it's some fact about colonialism that they're dragging up from a, from a Howard Zinn book that they read four years ago, and you don't know what they're talking about. And it's okay for you to, in, instead of you trying to, immediately, you don't have to know everything in the world. No one knows everything in the world. I mean, really. Uh, and, and so it's okay for you to say, you know, I, I haven't heard about that. I'll check it out. You know, after I confirm that, I'm happy to talk about that. But, you know, I don't know enough about that to really have this conversation. It's perfectly okay to do this. This is actually a, a crucial mistake that so many presidential candidates make. Right? You see presidential candidates, and they feel like they have to answer every question that's asked to them. And so they'll say things that just get them in trouble. Right? Even in debate, they'll say things that get them in trouble. And Donald Trump did this when he was, when, when he was on with, uh, with Hugh Hewitt. And Hugh Hewitt asked him, about the, the Al-Quds force, right, which the, and, and, he, and he immediately thought that, that Hewitt was talking about the Kurds, and he started talking about the Kurds because he didn't know anything about the Al-Quds force. Right? So the, he, he started sounding idiotic because he didn't know what he was talking about. He would have been better off to say, that's not an issue on which I've studied up, but that's why I have experts like you, Hugh, to tell me about it. Right? You're okay doing that. You don't always have to pretend that you know everything that there is to know. It's a good life rule. It's actually a really good marital rule as well. <laughs> uh, eighth rule. Don't get sucked in by the paradigm. Okay, so, so many of us, you know, we're, we're right wing. We're conservative. We're Republican. And we all love Reagan, for example, right? Love Reagan. Reagan's great. I love Reagan, too. Okay, so one of the things that the left will do, and you'll see it on immigration, for example, is the left will say things like, well, how could you be so hard line on illegal immigration when Reagan signed into law amnesty in 86? Right? And the idea is that Reagan's one of yours, and so you have to defend him. No matter what, you have to defend the paradigm. You must defend the paradigm. You don't have to defend the paradigm. You're allowed to say that Ronald Reagan got it wrong. Because on that one, Ronald Reagan, in my opinion, got it wrong. He got a lot of bigger things right, like taking down the Soviet Union. Right? His economic policies were right, but like everybody else, he was a flawed human being, and he would have been the first to admit it. And the same is true for George W. Bush. This is actually very important, because they'll bring up Bush a lot. You're allowed to say George W. Bush was wrong. Right? You're allowed to say that George W. Bush's second term was kind of a horror show, because it was kind of a horror show. You don't have to buy into everything that your side did, because it's not a team politics. It's not really a team sport. Politics is about individual philosophies. And is your individual philosophy good or is it bad? And this is why, for example, I consider myself a conservative first and not a Republican. Republican is just the party that has the candidates for whom I tend to vote, but my principles are not Republican principles. They're conservative principles. And should the Republican Party move away from those principles, then I won't vote for that particular candidate. You don't have to buy into whatever paradigm you're being pushed into by the left. Okay? That's, that's just a general rule. Ninth, ninth point of argument, and this is, this is one that's kind of fun that you can use. It's a, it's a fun parlor trick to use with, with leftists you have to talk to. And that is, let the other side, ha the, let the other side have meaningless victories. And what I mean by this is then you, you'll have conversations with people on the left and they'll say certain things and not define their terms. And their goal is to make you argumentative on every point so that you look like you're extreme. Right? They'll say things and then you feel the need to argue with them. You feel the need to come back at them because they're so wrong on everything and they are. But if you give them a point that's almost meaningless, then you can sometimes box them in. So for example, one of their favorites, they, they love using terms that don't mean anything. Right? They, they, they like saying things like, are you in favor of immigration reform is a good one. Right? Are you in favor of immigration reform? And the tendency is to say, no, I'm not in favor of immigration reform if you're hardcore on immigration. You can also say, sure, I'm in favor of immigration reform. What kind of immigration reform are you talking about? So for a second, they feel like they won, and then they didn't because you take it away from them asking them for, for definitions. Right? They do this on climate change, too. Say, do you believe in climate change? Are you a climate denier? Like, no, I, I don't deny the climate. It exists. Right? Do you believe in climate change? Well, yes. I mean, 
the climate changes. What are you talking about? Would you like to get more specific? Now, what percent? Do you know, for example, what percentage of human activity is responsible for the rise in climate? Do you have any clue what we would have to do in order to minimize human activity so as to go back to the amounts of carbon that were being sent into the atmosphere before the industrial age? Is that something that you're willing to? How many people are you willing to let die? How many people are you willing to impoverish based on lack of carbon-based fuels? How many people are you willing to let suffer? in order to do this. In the third world, by the way, because those are the people who are going to suffer if they're not using carbon-based fuels. You know, people on the left are very fond. They, they, they have this kind of rosy picture of what it would be like to go back in time. They would still get to keep their iPhone, but they'd go back in time. If they, <laughs> if they, if they really want to go back in time, there is a time machine on this planet. It's called an airplane. All you have to do is fly to the third world, and you just went back about 70 years in time. Right? And the fact is, they don't want to live with that. So you're allowed to give them these kind of minor victories where you where you say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, climate change. But then, then you hone in, right? Because they, they, they feel like they're on their home turf, and then you flip it on them, and it's a really fun little trick. Okay, <laughs> final point when it comes to arguing with the left and defeating them. And this is body language really counts a lot. Body language is huge. Very few Republicans actually understand the necessities of body language. One of the reasons Marco Rubio is so popular right now is because his body language is tremendous. He's got really good body language. He's always very open. He's always very upbeat. Uh, he, he doesn't look like he's upset or angry up there. Well, Jeb Bush, by contrast, has the worst body language of any candidate in the field. Uh, Je Jeb Bush looks like Kermit the Frog in desperate need of laxatives. And, <laughs> and, and whenever he's on the stage, it's just, he's so, I mean, his campaign slogan, honestly, his campaign slogan should be awkward, exclamation point. Because he's... <laughs> because he's just so awkward up there. I mean, regardless of what you think of his policies, he is not good when he's on these debate stages. This is one of the things that Republicans need to understand is that image actually matters. So today I'm dressed really poorly. Normally I dress a lot better. Didn't have time to get up to the nines today, but people, when, when I, I, I changed my haircut after I did the Piers Morgan interview, because there were a bunch of friends I had in Hollywood, and they said, your haircut's terrible, and you look like a college Republican president, no offense. And the... <laughs> And so I actually had to pay a stylist to, to come in and redo my hair and redo my wardrobe because I was going to be on TV a lot. And this sounds stupid because it kind of is, and this is how America works also. Right? The reason that Donald Trump is actually continuing to do well is because regardless of what you think of him, and my own take on him is that he's a buffoon, he's, he, he, Donald Trump is great at TV. He is tremendous at TV because he spent years doing it. Right? He spent years being on reality TV. He's fun to watch. If you just turn off the sound on a debate one time and watch the debate, the only one that you'll be watching is, is Trump, who I've, and, and he's really amusing. I mean, I've described him as fat lion, like he kind of sits in his cave and, and you poke at him and you poke at him and nothing happens, and then you poke him one time too many, and he saunters out and he kind of sways and then he eats your face. Um, but, he, but, but Trump, he's got an image and he presents that image to the world. Everybody has an image they present to the world. And this is, the left is better at this than the right. So the, the example that I typically like to use is back in 2008, Barack Obama, uh, no, you're, you should all be old enough to at least remember this, although you're probably kids because it's seven years ago. The, the, do you remember Barack Obama speaking at, at his DNC, and he comes out descending from the clouds? I mean, they literally had mist machines right, across the stage, and he comes out descending from the clouds, and behind him is the Greek pantheon. You remember all of this? He's got the big Greek columns, and he's got 60,000 people in the stadium. They're all going nuts, and they're all taking pictures with their cell phones, and all is flashing. I mean, it's like a Jay-Z concert. It's unbelievable. And... And it's great. I mean, terrific TV. And then he gets up there and he says all of the nasty BS that we're used to hearing from him for, for the last seven years. And he pretends that he's a, a good guy and everybody buys into it because he's a celeb. Right? And this makes sense because if you recall, the person who was doing his voiceovers was Tom Hanks. And he had an Oscar-winning director doing all of his videos. Right? He really took this stuff seriously. And then you went over to the RNC. And there was John McCain. And John McCain sort of toddles out there. And, he's, and, and, he, and John McCain is, is an older guy, and he also has physical infirmities from his time in Vietnam. So that's a, he has that against him just imagistically to start. But then they decide for some odd reason that behind him, they're going to put a, a green screen. Not like a green screen like Lord of the Rings green screen. We're going to project something cool. There will be like military. We'll, we'll have pictures of him from his past and aircraft carriers and military imagery. No, we're just going to have a lime green screen on national television for 20 minutes while this old man talks into the microphone. It looked like he was going to shoot a pornography in the San Fernando Valley. <laughs> and it's, and you, you contrast that with the, with the magic of Obama, and there was no contrast. 
If you're just the person who's watching this on TV, it looks like one group has their stuff together and the other group totally does not. Okay, so this is true for you. There are certain imagistic things that you can do that are, that are very easy. You just, the biggest one is open body language, right? So no fists, none of this. We all tend to do it. Everybody does it. You tend to, when you, te you tense up during conversation, your voice tends to rise, keep your voice low. This is actually what, what's driving Donald Trump insane right now is that Ben Carson is almost inaudible all the time. I mean, you, you, you have to check whether his microphone is on when his microphone is on. And so Trump, who is at, I mean, he's like a spinal tap 11 on the scale of 10. And, but, but, and Carson is just, I mean, he, he's so taciturn that it's impossible for Trump to handle him. He can't, he can't do anything about it, right? So you had Trump going nuts last night, like purely nuts. I mean, getting, did you see, who saw, have you seen clips from his speech last night, Trump? He gets out from behind the podium and reenacts being stabbed in the belt. Yeah. It's wild. So he does that. He did that last night in Iowa after calling Iowan voters stupid for giving, Don, for giving Ben Carson the lead. And, uh, and then Ben Carson did what he does best, which is he ticked off Donald Trump beyond all human measure by saying that he would pray for Donald Trump. <laughs> this is how imagistics and body image can be your friend. If Donald Trump is going to be aggressive, then you just be passive. You just be passive. Just let... Uh, we're just here to have a conversation. You can say the nastiest things and be super passive about it. And, and you can get away with it so long as your body language is not nasty and aggressive. So body language does matter. I mean, Bill Clinton was the master of body language for a variety of reasons. And, and he... And <coughs> one, one, of the, one of the things that he learned, he, and he trained with people to do a lot of this stuff. Like, you'll, you'll see Rubio using some of the same hand motions. So, so Clinton had the hand motion where instead of, instead of pointing at people, he didn't do the Bill O'Reilly finger of truth, which is, I'm strong and I know better than you, right? This, the factor. Uh, it's, it's, it, it was instead Bill Clinton doing this, right? It's the elevator button push, right? Because he's convincing you and he's strong, but he's not too strong, right? He's just, he's just trying to wheedle you. And Bill Clinton had several different types of hand... He is the master of this. He had several different types of handshakes. He has a handshake that's just for people who he's who he is meeting in passing, right, it's a regular handshake, and then he's got the handshake for people who he might hit up for money later, which is he, hit, he grabs the hand here and then the other hand goes on the forearm. He has the one for people who are already big donors, he goes to the shoulder, and then he has the one for Clinton Foundation donors from Zimbabwe, and that's like all the way up to the neck, it's almost a hug, and then he has one for Monica Lewinsky, and that's totally different. <laughs> so. So body language, body language does matter in all of this. So those are, those are your 10 quick lessons. Hit first, frame your opponent, frame the debate, spot inconsistencies in their arguments, force them to answer questions. Don't get distracted. If you don't know something, admit it. Don't get sucked in by the paradigm. Make sure, make sure that you uh, let the other side have a meaningless victory or two so they feel like they're accepted. Uh, and, then, and then use good body language at all times. The bottom line here is that every time you walk out now, if you're going to be a conservative and you're going to be a fighter, Every time you walk out is a fight. There is no such thing as a nice moment from here on in. Now, there are some, of, there are some people who find this off-putting. Uh, it is tiring from time to time, so make sure that you actually have you know, a life outside of this. But the fight can be a lot of fun. If you're aggressive and if you have fun with it and if you let this stuff roll off your back, you have to make it fun. If it's not fun, it's not worth doing. And fighting bad people and, and people with horrible ideas is fun. And it is worthwhile. There's not a cause that I think that's, that, that's out there that's better on earth. I mean, one of the mistakes conservatives have made, I think, with young people is telling them that what they're really fighting for is just capitalism and a better way of life. And it's, and it's not fully true. It's true, but it's not fully true. What you're fighting for is a higher cause. And that higher cause is freedom and liberty and a concept of the universe in which duty exists and actions have consequences. And the people who you are fighting, don't, they're not just wrong. The people who you're fighting believe in evil concepts. Leftism is an evil concept. Communism is an evil concept. I mean, you're going to hear about this all this weekend. These are, not just, these are moral issues. These are not just economic issues. These are not just we all get along and we have the same vision for the future. We don't have the same vision for the future. Hillary Clinton has a very different vision for the future than people on the right. Barack Obama clearly has a very different vision for the future than people on the right. These idiot protesters, these mental midgets over at University of Missouri have a very different idea of what the future looks like than everybody on the right. And it's a nasty vision of the future. And it's a gross and racist vision of the future. These Mizzou students complaining about racism, you saw this the other day. They banned white students from their safe space. The, the, the KKK fully endorses these safe spaces. They had, safe, they had spaces that were both separate and equal. 
No one actually said to them what ha I don't know what the what the the water fountain situation was like over at Mizzou after in these safe spaces. But it's just it's demonstrative of the fact that the left d has awful awful values. And so fighting those awful values is to me the highest calling that you can have in politics. And if it's a fight worth having, it's a fight worth doing right. Thanks so much. Happy